Welcome to the Cold Steel Surgical Podcast with your hosts, Amir Farouk and Chad Ball. Dr. McCall, thank you so much for joining us in the Cold Steel Podcast. It's an absolute honor and a pleasure to have a friend and a colleague join us on the show. Thank you for all that you do uh, for for the General Surgery Program at the University of Alberta. Uh, We know how much work goes into this. Can you tell us a little bit about the University of Alberta General Surgery Residency Program? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. So, I took over as program director uh, July 1st, 2022. So I'm in my first year as program director. I, I honestly think we have an extremely strong uh, program. And just before I started, I, I polled our residents individually as to what they thought were sort of the strengths and weaknesses of the program. And through the years, the strengths for us has always been case volume and case variety. And that really hasn't changed over the years. And, and, you know, as a program director, I I don't really have to do much to uh, for that because it's sort of inherent in our program. We have three main teaching sites. So the uh, the U of A hospital, the Royal Alexandra hospital, the Grey Nuns hospital, sorry, the uh, Misericordia hospital, which is a a community site. We also use the Fort Saskatchewan hospital for uh, endoscopy. And so we've got a very diverse group, a lot of variety. Um, and so all the residents said that the number one strength of the program was was case volume, case variety. They're essentially operating every day. And the second thing they said was that was the people and, and they meant the surgeons and the residents. So they're, they're co-residents. And it, it's a very, very diverse group and a very collegial group. And, and I was happy to say they also said that the surgeons were excellent. So uh, I, I, I sure I don't have any role in hiring the surgeons, but I, I can certainly cultivate uh, so, uh, the, the connection between the, the surgeons and the residents. And I think we have a very, very strong one. I'm going to jump right to it. And for our, our listeners and our applicants, they have to recognize this is a biased question, sure. which is that I grew up in Edmonton and I went to U of A as an undergrad. Amir's from Edmonton and you're living in Edmonton. So mm-hmm. I think the three of us know what's great about E-Town besides yeah. the Oilers. But what what do you say to people maybe who don't know Edmonton very well? What what do you like about that city and, uh, and yeah, not necessarily selling it, but you know, it's just honestly speaking, it's a great place to live. What do you think? Yeah, so I'll give you my background personally, so you know where I'm coming from. So I grew up as you as you know in North Vancouver, and so I, I'm a I'm a diehard Canucks fan still. You know, I've been in Edmonton since uh, start of medical school, so that just gives you a background. So. While while I am biased because I live here now, I sort of come from a, a, a slightly larger city. That being said, um, and uh, sorry, a city where with the weather pattern was much different than it than it is here in, in Edmonton. That being said, um, w- when you think about what's what's great about Edmonton, so uh, the summers and falls here are excellent. Our river valley is second to none, and if you like outdoor uh, activities, then you will find everything in the river valley. Big mountains are not that far away, certainly not quite as close as Calgary, but Jasper and Banff are about equally four hours away. You can find a lot to do in the city outdoors and indoors. Um, from We have a re- really, really good um, group of core, core restaurants here, and there's new restaurants popping up all the time. Everyone always mentions that they, they never have problem finding a great meal here in, in Edmonton. Another thing that sort of I took for granted, you know, I, I had long commutes to to school and work in, in Vancouver, and you really couldn't get anywhere, you know, and without taking an hour or more. There's really no commute from anywhere you live to any of the hospitals or anywhere in the city that's more than 30 minutes. I can literally get from, and I live sort of not quite as far south as you can get in the city, but fairly far south. And I work at the Royal Alex, which is pretty far on the north side. It doesn't take me more than 30 minutes, even in in bad traffic. So really no one's more than 30 minutes away from anything. And I would say most residents commutes probably about 15, 20 minutes. And in in the early morning hours, it can be even less than that. But that certainly makes a a big difference, especially when you're on a service with home call. Uh, Some residents even bike commute. Um, 
you know, like I said, the mountains are very close. And as you mentioned, the Oilers, I, I have run into Connor McDavid a, a couple of times out in the uh, out in Edmonton. It's he's he's a big deal here. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I'll, I'm going to make a plug, shameless plug for Donairs. Like, there's no better place for Donairs than in Canada than Edmonton. I'm just going to put it out there. <laughs> it's it's a thing. Um, tell, can you tell us a little bit, Mike, about the structure of the program? How is yeah. it? I know it's five years, obviously, but tell us a little bit about how the program is structured and what yeah. residents can expect. Yeah. So I I would say we are our senior resident weighted and what. I don't mean more resident, but in terms of the operative um, uh, skills, we weight those more on the senior year. So what that means is, is year one, we really want residents to get a good grasp on ward management, seeing consults, being comfortable seeing patients, seeing sick patients and emerge. You will do some operating in R1, and, but as opposed to other programs, I don't think you'd come out of our first year being able to do an appendix or a gallbladder skin to skin. That being said, you will be very comfortable answering ward calls and going to emerge and seeing consults and interacting with the surgeons. And then as we get farther along into second year, and by the time you've done ICU in second year, there's really no consult and no patient that, you, that you're not comfortable seeing. And, and I say I, a general surgery resident who's done their ICU is probably one of the best physicians in the hospital in, in Edmonton. When you get to third year, that's when you take on the senior resident role. So you have a junior resident on call with you. And if, if you're at one of our trauma or our, our larger tertiary sites, it's in-house call with a junior resident, a senior resident, and, and a staff. And so that's when you're really, your operative skills really take off. You're reviewing consults. So you're, you're practicing being that senior learner, that, that consultant, and then you're re, uh, reviewing directly with the staff. There's a chance to do home calls, certainly at, at the smaller sites. And by the time you get to our fifth year, which we still call a, a, a chief year, you're running your own team, you're operating most days, uh, and you're getting ready for your exam. By the time exam time comes around, you're, you're, you're really prepared. I think one of the best rotations I'll highlight is in fourth year, we have a three-month rural rotation, and we use Grand Prairie almost exclusively with a bit of use of, of Red Deer. I, and that's one of the most well-received uh, rotations in our in our program. Because by then you're really you're just wanting volume, and, and those three months are are a high volume uh, operative exposure. And by the time you come back from Grand Prairie, you've seen almost everything, and and you're really just looking to get, you know, some of those more niche cases, those one-off cases. And starting to teach the junior residents more. So you're sort of passing on your skills to some of the junior learners. Yeah, that's great, Mike. You know, I'll say it for you so you don't have to. It's clear that graduates that come out of the University of Alberta General Surgery Program can and often do whatever they want with regards to fellowships and or community jobs or elsewhere. Can you give the listener a bit of a sense of what some of your graduates have done and, and maybe who the program is geared to or uh, just sort of the outlook for them? Yeah, I think, honestly, as you mentioned, and, and thanks for that plug, you can really do anything from the program. So we did, so I would say a, on average about one resident a year, and there's about five to six residents who graduate per year. Uh, we take in six per year. Um one of those in general goes out to community practice and i think they're very well prepared through our program so one of our graduates from last year just started working at the gray nuns hospital in edmonton the majority go and do fellowships so and i now you get a sense that that the fellowships that the residents go off and do i think are heavily weighted by what they're offered and what they see in their home program so from edmonton that would be uh, laparoscopic with, with a bariatrics uh, tweak that's surgical oncology and that's hepatobiliary. So current year graduates and also in trauma. So we've got a, a resident going down to Houston to do a trauma fellowship following in Bonnie Sang's uh, footsteps. We've got a resident going to the Mayo Clinic to do transplant, HPV transplant, a resident going to Winnipeg for a laparoscopic fellowship, one going to the Toronto North Humber program to do the two-year laparoscopic uh, uh, fellowship, and one going to Vancouver to do colorectal. So we've had a, we've had actually a, a, a number of residents do colorectal, and, and the two big centers they go to would be 
uh, Calgary and Vancouver, uh, and less so Toronto. Yeah, I was I was scared that you were not going to say colorectal for a second, considering it's the <laughs> considering it's the best specialty. Yeah, uh, you know, I think about one per year, and it, as you know, it comes in waves. Like we we had one year where there was two residents who went off to do pediatric surgery, and then I I don't know of another one in the program. There might be one who's who's geared toward peds, and then all of a sudden a year will come and there'll be like another another two. So uh, I think colorectal, laparoscopic. And oncology focused uh, tend to be a fairly constant in our program, though. Yeah, it's a great mix, and I think, as you say, uh, uh, graduates are well prepared. Um, uh, if people want to do research, Mike, what opportunities are there for people to do research, uh, either dedicated or within the program? Yeah, so uh, a lot of the students, and as I've been reading through CARMS files, a lot of the students will mention the clinician investigator program, the CIP program. I'm not sure they really know exactly what that is. So I, I think it's worth just taking a second to mention that. So it's a dedicated two-year leave of absence from residency, usually after second year. And you actually enter in a separate residency program called this, the CIP or the, the Clinician Investigator Program. It's not surgery or general surgery specific. And it's an opportunity as long as you have a preceptor and a project to get funded for two years of um, of research in a separate residency program, you would then return after those two years back to third year in general surgery. So I did that when I was going through and I actually did a third year and I did mine with James Shapiro. So obviously James Shapiro's lab, well known. He has at least one resident from our program in his lab at, at all times. One of the residents heading off July 1st is going to be in his lab. The other research opportunities are, would be um, uh, otherwise basic science with, with Crohn's disease and in the pediatric group. We've also had a number of residents who've gone off and done master's in education and master's in public health. I think one of the first ones was Simon Turner, who's a thoracic surgeon, and he does his with John White, who you know from, a, from another Surgery 101 podcast, and, and, and John uh, has a big history of education. So really what we have opportunities for would be basic science, which is what I did and what a number of residents do, masters of public health and masters in education. And so I, I have no control as the Gen Surge Program Director over who, how, whether a resident gets into the CIP program, you have to apply. But our residents have usually had a high rate of success of, of obtaining the CIP residency. Outside of that, it would be hard to find funding for resident for research, but certainly we encourage and we have rules on doing research within residency. We just ask that residents present three times at our local general surgery research day, but only twice if they take one of those projects and present at a national or international level, which many of them do. That's great, Mike. Thank you for uh, your candor and your description of the U of A program. It's it's awesome. In closing, and, and, and with respect to your time, can you tell our applicants uh, any advice that you have for them, or anything, any comments that would be helpful in their in their voyage across the country in these applications? You know, I I, I think so. These these last couple of years are really weird with with COVID and. As a program director, I know my own candidates at U of A very well because many of them think they have to do a, a, an elective with myself or at my hospital. So I think I've met all of them. But I, I, I don't really know, other than a few word of mouth cases of residents or sorry, applicants outside of, of Edmonton, that's going to change as the years come. And so I think this year, as last year, the interview is very important. Like a lot of applicants look very similar. And, and by that, I mean, excellent on paper. So it's separating yourself in an interview. And it doesn't mean go over the top and, and say something, you know, uh, off, 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 off base, but just be yourself in, in an interview. I think in an interview in, in COVID, if they're going to be virtual interviews, it, it's sort of like being a, on a sports team, but having home field advantage, like you're, you're on your home ice. You're in your home environment. You have the ability to set that up any way you want, um, whether it's lighting, sound, a background. I mean, if I came on a, a, an interview and I had Captain America in the background, I, I think it might say something about me. I don't know if that's good or bad. but <laughs> So I, I think use that home field advantage to your advantage um, 
you know, many sports teams play better at home. And I, I think you probably interview better at home. So that being said, on the interview, just be yourself. We're, we're looking for really good candidates. We have all the information about you. We have reference letters, people gushing about you. So I think that interview is very, very important and, and more important in the last couple of years. You've been listening to Cold Steel, the official podcast of the Canadian Journal of Surgery. If you like what you've heard, please leave us a review on iTunes. We love to hear your thoughts, comments, and feedback. So send us an email at podcast.cjs at gmail.com or tweet at us at CanJSurge. Thanks again.